All right, good morning, everybody. Good to get going. All right, morning, everybody. So, uh, welcome to the debrief. So, uh, first, applaud all of you for putting together great proposals yesterday. And I just want to tell y'all, I am not as good of a public speaker as like 80% of y'all or most of y'all. So, um, sorry if I'm not like on top of my game like you guys. Y'all did fantastic, though. So, we're going to talk about Wilson Creek Meadows. Um, Pulte Group um, sponsors my company. We have different brands Pulte, Syntex, Web, Devasta, John Whelan, Pulte Mortgage. Um, so we'll go ahead and kick off. Who is our target consumer group? So this is something that a lot of you dug into and did very, really well. Um, this is what our target consumer group for this community. So it's high income families, single family, detached, mid to high incomes, upperly mobile. Sales price is typically 110% to 150% of market median. Younger children, primarily under 12. Four bedrooms are critical. Traditional suburban neighborhoods, commute is a very key consideration. Highly focused on well-ranked schools and safety. See home as a major investment, but are still value conscious. Want large homes that are within their budget. Optionality is important. All right, this is a move up buyer. This is how we're profiling this community. So, um, you know, the PD was sent to all of you. That's the, the plan development. I just wanted to go over this because it kind of got some confusion out there. It's a part of a whole. So we are giving you guys Wilson Creek Meadows West, which is the, the parcel that Pulte Homes is purchasing. It is a part of the entire PD, though, the entire set of property that is guided by those restrictions. So there is a Wilson Creek Meadows East, which is a parcel of land uh, bought and in, under construction with another builder but they have to follow the same guidance of us on Wilson Creek West. Um, we just separated out who's purchasing different parcels. Um, let's see here. Yep. Site design. So this is how we are doing our site design. Phase one, right through the middle. We did this to make sure we could run our, our utilities kind of uh, laterally along the property line. So essentially when it comes to phase two, we can tee off, go to the north, go to the south from that point. We do have our model park and amenity center as noted here. We're gonna be modeling um, two different series and, um, and we have color coded the different size lots. So. Our 50 foot lots, which is a majority of it, is 148 in phase one, 260s in phase one, which are likely our model lots, yep, and 53 70 foot lots. So 203 for the first phase, 222 total for the second phase, a total of 425. Now a lot of you did a great job at getting different lot types, A, B, and C in there. Um, I did wanna talk about the overall um, PD requirements talking about open space, so it did mention a requirement of 36 acres. That is for the entire PD, inclusive of East, Wilson Creek East, which we're not doing. So technically, you could have had a little bit less green space on the west side of what we're developing. Our density comes out to be about um, 3.69 net per acre. All right, a lot of you have this in y'all's um, in y'all's presentations, in y'all's books, you kind of understand the difference between those lots, types A, B, and C. I want to talk about amenities. So amenities, it is, it is not very common to have a, a, a PD like this that is extremely prescriptive in, in everything you have to have in your amenities, but it's fully required to check all of these boxes. Um, enclosed restrooms, changing areas, covered patio, swimming pool, children's splash pad, artificial grass, two fire pits, playground with 12 play elements and 14 parking spaces. So we have to do every single one of these. And this is some of the things when we were looking at y'all's amenities, a lot of these boxes, they need to be checked in order to get approved by the city to proceed to build. So this is what we're doing. Um, basically, we have a covered area with some restrooms um, right here, a, a pool. This is the children's splash pad right here. Two fireplaces on site, that turf area playground, parking lot with the 14 spaces. Now, I'll show you guys the elevations on this. This is the side elevation and this is the front elevation. It's not too complicated, but this is approximately 1.7 to $2.3 million. So 
Um, and looking at a lot of y'all's amenities, you know, we had these big elaborate um, clubhouses and which around the same price, but we got to think some of the cost of these amenities can be extremely expensive. And a piece to think about when it comes to your amenities, here's a picture of the playground, is those HOA fees. So HOA fees don't just cover, you know, that amenity. You're thinking of all that green space that's irrigated, the walking trail, the maintenance of that. Um, and a reserve for future upkeep and damage for all of these things. So um, I enjoy that a lot of giant um, amenities were considered. Um, just think of that cost piece to it. So we are having a high income profile here. But they're still cost conscious. So that HOA fee can be a detriment if it's too high, if you have too many amenities to maintain. All right, let's dig into product design. We are doing two different series, a 40 foot wide home placed on 50 foot lots and 50 foot wide homes placed on 60 and 70 foot lots. There's a potential to build our 40 foot homes on the larger 70 foot lots too. That's a concept called underbuilding essentially. So you may have a smaller product on a lot intended for a larger lot. But we have on the two series, we have the top section on the 50s are the 40 foot wide homes, ranging from 1600 square foot to 3200 square feet. And then the 60s is 2,500 square feet to 3,600 square feet. So we got a wide range there. So keep in mind, you know, we, we do have demographics wanting, you know, single story, two story, but having that good mix also of square footage, a wide range also helps you with your competitors of multiple rangers. Some of your 3,600 square foot can compete maybe close to the customs, not necessarily there, but um, you'll also have a benefit of having some of the smaller ones at a, at a smaller price point to also kick into this market that is uber competitive and, and higher priced in a lot of ways. So, just gonna go through all these. I'm not gonna go through every plan in detail, y'all. I actually saw one of the teams had this plan specifically in theirs, so good job, good taste, uh, yesterday. Uh, this is the McKinney plan, it's our most popular single. One of the things I just like to mention is just adding these optionalities here. So especially in the, in the market right now with COVID, you know, the focus on living at home, which a lot of you hit on is very important. So I saw some formal dinings in there. And if you're gonna have a formal dining, have that option maybe to make it a study, to make it an extra bedroom. Um, we also have our own concept called the Little Pulte Planning Center, which is little spaces that um, are kind of separated from the kitchen, allow maybe the kiddos to do their homework, keep that paperwork out of the kitchen, still keep an eye on them. So um, just something that we started including in our houses a while back. Um, this is basically a, a second story version of the home we just looked at, the, the Moorville. Um, first floor is the exact same with the added second floor onto it. And this is the Lexington, which is the largest of the 40 foot product series. Two story, you know, we have optionality to do bay windows, um, optional media rooms upstairs, um, study in lieu of that flex space. A lot of you did include flex spaces, so flex is a really cool because you can have the ability to make them bedrooms or studies and have that ability. So remember we talked about optionality was important for our consumer group, right? The Dunlay, this is getting into the 50 series now. So, um, you know, we're wider here, but we still take um, optionality into consideration, having those optional bedrooms. The Kennedale, so this is where we start getting into the two-story concept. We just have a loft upstairs, but you could have a loft with an op optional um, bathroom, still have that optional study there, and uh, optional dining too, in case somebody would like that. But I can tell you the dinings aren't having a really high take rate right now. The Lawson plan, two-story. Um, one of the best selling of this series. Also has that study, very open concept. One of my favorite plans that we offer. Um, has a fantastic media room upstairs, most bedrooms upstairs, and it's really common to see, just in mentioning all these plans, the owner suite downstairs. We're starting to get into owners up. Um, it's not a common thing for Texas, but um, majority of the time in this market, you'll see owner suite downstairs. All right, included features. I'm not gonna go through everything here. Just wanna focus on optionality. So this buyer goes to a design center they're not given option package A, B, C, bronze, silver, gold. They're given, hey, here is all of your level one cabinets, all your level two cabinets, all your level three cabinets, five or six in each section. They have the ability to customize. So the market is shifting to where a lot of builders, a lot of products are going towards that packaging concept. Um, it's not something that we have really ventured yet with this specific consumer. You'll probably see in single um, first time home buyers having that package concept. But at a price point where we're at with this, that optionality is really important. 
Um, when it comes to exterior, we are you know clay brick. A lot of the PD also outlined 80% requirement um, for brick on the homes in general. Um, they the Texas they don't like a lot of siding unfortunately on the front of the homes on the side of the homes um, they did pass a law in texas two years ago where cities technically can't dictate what's going on your homes material wise and that's happening in other states right now too but um, this pd is kind of a document and tool used and created before that law changed to help get around that so they can allow us to dictate what material we're putting on the homes all right approximate sales pricing average um, is around 468 base for this product series. We're, you know, because they have that optionality, we're assuming between a $25,000 to $52,000 spend on options. This is inclusive of your structural. It's inclusive of going to Design Center too. Um, our lot premiums, TBD. We typically establish those as we get a little bit closer. Um, we've got plan approved now from the city and we're underway on the development of the property. Um, but things change. We're not right now going to probably start homes until sometime in 2023. We already purchased this property last September, actually. All right, I just want to dig into management a little bit. So anticipated time frame on per, from our purchase point to the time of vertical construction. So um, currently, we, we anticipated it to be a 13 month time from when we purchased it to when we start building homes. We're trending 16 to 18 months. A lot of this is city alignment. Sometimes when it comes to designing these plans, we have to go in front of the city, show them our plans. They'll give us red lines of changes they want to make. We had to do that process two or three times so far. Um, a lot of you noted that Salina does have that 2040 plan. What comes with that is a great eye for detail to make sure this is a community that is going to align with their city standards. So we got to take that timing and that due diligence into consideration. So a lot of you maybe had, I think, vertical start sometime within 2022. I would definitely just establish that it's gonna take a little bit longer, but you wouldn't have known of this city's particular pickiness, unfortunately, but in general, we, we'd planned 13 months. Normal construction cycle time for the vertical build, the home, uh, the home construction cycle time. Under normal circumstances prior to 2021, we as, as a production builder, we're aiming between 80 to 90 business days for a cycle time of a home. Now that is tight. Um, not all production builders are at that level of tightness. Um, but right now we're currently trending between 115 to 130 days, which is significantly longer um, than what we need because of supply chain, a lot of obstacles, changes every day, cabinets, appliances, you, all the people over in that room, I love them, but we're missing a lot of things here and there, <laughs> okay? Um, there's a high demand in the North Texas market driving demand for these products. Um, the limited skill labor force, um, varying COVID-19 restrictions. So with that giant demand, that influx of migration into Texas with the supply constraints, we're being capped by a lot of our vendors. So I'm not, I'm not saying any vendor specifically, but one would say, hey, you normally get X amount. We'll let, normally give you however much you say you need. We're going to give you 80% of what you need. So you need to figure out how to realign your, your business to fit what we can give you. So that is causing a lot of constraints in cycle time. I can talk all day on this, but I'm not. So moving on. All right. How do we schedule a Pulte? We have a proprietary scheduling system. It is called Schedules Portal. Um, we have a centralized scheduling team, actually, an expediter. Um, ones that are kind of air traffic control for all of our schedules, our construction managers feed to them, and they're the ones that make the adjustments. And we have a, a system called Bill with Pulte, feeds directly to our contractors. They're able to see all their schedules in real time, and it's really effective being centralized in so many ways because you can prioritize what is the most important, what's the furthest behind, batch effectively. So that's a piece of how we operate kind of on the production side for us. All right, when it comes to staffing, I may have left a few out here, but we have one area construction manager that oversees multiple communities. A construction manager who oversees the day-to-day -day in this community will have typically one to three. We have one expediter who manages about maybe five to six communities around the Metroplex, but they would oversee this community for the scheduling side. A sales consultant, typically see one to two. They write contracts with potential buyers. Um, this is a big thing on this um, project is a lot of times we started seeing sales before model homes and we're asking, where are these sales happening? Online is a fantastic answer. Um, 
we still need to get in paper that, that contract recording. We need to have, have that in-person meeting with the sales consultants. So a strategy a lot of you could have mentioned is a sales trailer. So we can set up a sales trailer to the time that we get city acceptance, can start building vertical to start selling out of that location. Or if you have an existing community with a very similar product, that could be an example. They could go sell out of that model if it's close, route people online to there, and you can get your pre-sales there. Um, customer care manager. They all see overall our, all of our warranty items. Um, typically, we have one to two once we start seeing homes start to close out in the community. And then you'd have a sales, general sales manager as well who is over multiple communities who is in that structure. Not going to dig too much into this. A lot of you had a, a prescriptive home build quality experience and, and, and path like this with multiple touch points with your buyers. Our main thing is we have our touch points. Obviously, when they sign a contract, we when they start their home, talk about expectations, meet them at frame, show them the quality in, in the build, show them what's behind the walls, let them ask questions. It's a very important time in the construction build, and we call it a celebration. A celebration is at the very end where we walk with our buyers and um, congratulate them. It's about a week before closing, typically. Um, teach them how the home works and operates, um, and we like to call it a celebration because that really is what it is. All right, when it comes to marketing, a lot of you already have this competitive data in yours, so I'm not going to really dig into it. Um, we are, you know, we do have multiple out here. Um, our, our biggest communities, a lot of you did hit, you know, Mustang Le Lakes, um, a few others, Liliana was one of them. But when it comes to effective marketing, I did want to hit on this. Um, you know, social media is fantastic. Um, internet paid searches are very useful, um, driving that the, those consumers. One thing I did want to hit on was um, we talked about search engine optimization, which is where you know you add keywords essentially on your website um, over and over and over and over to try to pull those consumers when they search like on Google. But I didn't want to hit on marketing to reconsider. So in DFW specifically, D uh, billboards and probably other markets too, but billboards we're starting to find are costly and not the most effective. Can you think of how many times any of y'all have driven by a billboard and it really went to that website that it was advertising? I, I can't. So. Um, and it, a lot of cities restrict it in DFW, too. Um, when it comes to TV advertising and printing, um, print, uh, you know, mailers, advertising on TV, magazines, lifestyle magazines, that's really effective for an active adult market, I'm being honest on that. Um, but you're going to see a lot of the things for social media and online with this target consumer, a bulk of your cost going to that. So I wouldn't really allocate much to billboards, to print, or to TV advertising. Did want to hit this, what's next? So for us as a builder, we're, we're going towards transact home online. This is our next step, essentially. We're going to start giving consumers the optionality to go to our website, pick their options, buy the house on the website. So um, don't have a lot of details on that. It's still coming out this year. But some of you have mentioned that in y'all's proposals, which is a great kind of future step. All right, financial. We are approximately looking to do 9 to 12 starts per month. And that's a mix between the two different products. Um, close that. We're projecting, you know, late of 2027. I didn't include our optimistic and pessimistic because I'm just an optimistic person. We're going we're gonna to kill it, y'all. This is a great market. All right. Lot cost. I would say for the lot cost, we're about 65 to 85. That is not inclusive of your purchase price of the lot. That is just the development cost of the lot. Um, this is a raw deal, so we are developing a bit all of ourselves and building it out entirely by Pulte. We have an in-house land development team um, that does this for us. And I would say, you know, a, a feasible IRR is 23 to 29%, which a lot of you did hit there. Um, I'm not going to dig too much into that, but here's some of the bigger hit items here. So I want to give a thanks to all of y'all. Um, I will have, we're about to go to questions real quick, but um, I, just some feedback. In, in, getting with you guys, and maybe this is something you can talk to your advisors after. We're just curious if, if you guys had used Zonda, um, looking into your comp competition. Um, was it effective? Did you have access to it? Because um, it is a great tool. It's a great resource. It's one of the best ones to go to right now, as opposed to just Googling it. Because um, there's so many different, so much mixed information out there. We saw average ages ranging, average um, salaries ranging. So going to the best place is Zonda. So um, going to add this in there in general. Um, talk to your advisors if you didn't have access to this or um, if you didn't, didn't find it effective or didn't know how to work on it, let us know, okay? So, going to open it up to questions now for this property.
Why did I put the amenity center under the electrical lines, Tom? <laughs> Colin is out. You know, I'm going to have to get back to you with that. <laughs> I'll get back with you on that. What else we got? So I have a question about the amenities. So uh -huh. I noticed you have your amenity center, and then also for the um, PD Planet gives what that amenity center needs to have. In addition to the amenities at your, I guess, like amenity center, what are the other amenities throughout your development, or was it just specifically centered right there? That is the extent of our amenities. All right, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Can you, well, I guess I have a follow-up question. Um, can you speak to why you all just kept it center, centralized and didn't, you know, kind of pass it out throughout the um, so, uh, you know, I mean, we're going to have a lot of these green spaces are going to be irrigated, um, benches throughout as well. It, it will still have that green vibe to it. That, that, and, and I actually, I, a lot of you guys put a trail on this easement, and that may be something we're doing. I just didn't get it captured here yet, so that's a good possibility. Um, just in terms of amenity in general, like I mentioned, that cost is really high on amenities. And you have to think of this as still a high income, but still one that focuses on value. So adding too much on there adds to their maintenance long term, adds those HOA fees. You got to be very careful. I think we initially quoted um, our amenity to be around a million, <laughs> quickly escalated to two. We'll see what happens at the end. Things are still going up in many ways, so we got to just be cautious on that. Yep. Hey. Um, so yeah, my questions are also on for this slide. Um, I guess my first question was if you. Uh, I was a little more curious about the integrating the utilities into the phasing mm -hmm. and how you, how you chose to do that. So I was just wondering if you could maybe ha provide a little more insight on that. Like utilities like? You, you said uh, you did it so that you could run the utility lines oh, horizontally right. for the phasing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we were, so in thinking of this, in running the, the sewer and the water essentially all through this phase one. So whenever it comes to doing development for phase two, We've already run a good main throughout the good portion of phase one. We can tee off and just go southwards instead of, you know, if we decided to do like quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, quadrant four, quadrant five, you know, you're doing this piece and then you'd be doing this piece and it's just trying to make that as, as simplistic as possible. I'm not on the LD side, but I hope I answered that to the best of what you're asking. Yeah, that was great. And then uh, I was also uh, just wondering about your choice of location for the model homes and why, why you decided to put them there. Good question. Right next to those power lines. You know what? Um, th that's a valid point. You know, we, we do like to have them, obviously, in first phase is important. Um, when you come into the community, I'm, I'm assuming we're going to have this against some green space here. I know the power lines are there. I'm assuming we'll hopefully have a trail, fingers crossed. Um, the power lines are, can be kind of loud. And this may be something we may reconsider. I don't know. It's, it's a good question, so thank you. Hey, um, I was just wondering um, if you knew uh, what's what's to the north of the property. I saw I saw it was undeveloped, but uh, do you have any idea what's above us? I do not. Okay. Okay. I apologize. And then I was also going to ask, uh, what's it like dealing with the city of Salina? You said sometimes it could be a hassle. Just curious, what's it like? I'm not picking on Salina. They're a great city. <laughs> um, no, they're they're. They're, no, they, they are. They're a very well-run city. They have a very good plan for future growth. Um, it's just all cities in North Texas, there's, it's very heavy on the permitting side, on the review side, which is good because you have a second and third set of eyes on things. Um, but like I mentioned, you know, they do have that potential and they have that need for that positive growth, for that equity, that triple bottom line that some of you guys mentioned in your proposals. And a piece of making sure that's done right is making sure that people you're allowing to build in your city is done right and aligns too. So they gotta make sure that that due diligence is taken on their end. Good morning, what, what do you determine to be your target market for selling these homes? Target market. Um, high income families, single family detached, is there like what what other things outside of that, or? Um, I'm guessing more so like age range. Or oh, okay, things like that. Demographic. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm going to quote an age range specifically, um, but I will say that these are the core items that 
we that they seek value in and that's what we look at in our target consumer groups is what they find important so some somebody even whether they're 55 or 32 may have the same values may have the same items of importance that's really what we focus on um, yeah I should have a question about <coughs> sensitivity stuff and mm -hmm. how are you currently dealing with variability in construction costs and how is that affecting IRR and mm -hmm. kind of that bottom line with how it's going right now? It's a very good question. So, um, you know, we've had to change strategies in how we sell homes because we know that, you know, we, when we sign a contract, we're not going to change that contract with our buyer, the sales price. But the construction costs do keep going up. So we just had to pivot in how we start selling homes. So, for example, in Dallas-Fort Worth, we've changed to starting to sell homes once the frame drops as opposed to before it even starts like that home has to have a frame on its poured slab and then at that point we would have seen maybe a lot of those cost increases already factored into the home so we can know appropriately how to price it um, in this consumer specifically we're also doing this strategy um, where basically we have a set of maybe eight lots on a monthly basis this is all the sales consultant um, will be selling and they the buyers come in on a long list and they put bids on these lots so buyer comes in i'm going to give you ten thousand extra next person comes in i'm going to give you fifteen thousand extra that's a different strategy on this higher end product i'm not sure if that's what we're going to be doing in this specific community but the big piece of it i think is just pushing out the sales timing so we better understand what our construction costs are mm -hmm. oh Yeah. So we're doing monthly releases, but we meet every Thursday to adjust price. So if we might not raise the price in every community every Thursday, but you know that that's sort of how we do it. And yeah. Everyone's different, and it, even each community we do is different too. They all live differently. Because our permitting process is so long, and we allow a little more customization. If we don't have, you know, especially for our single families, if we don't have that contract in hand, we don't know which structural options are. Mm -hmm. So for us, we have to have that contract in order to move forward. Yeah. So we kind of take a little more risk on the, the cost escalation side mm -hmm. and, and maybe hold the right piece. Yeah. And like this product is not one we would do the hold off and sell it frame. This, that, that would be your typically our entry level where we're not allowing optionality, where optionality is not their focus or it's not one of their highest values. So. We're all still figuring it out. This year has been the year of pivot and changing strategies on the fly, mm -hmm. and fingers crossed and some prayers that it works, right? <laughs> all right, what else we got? I have a question. So I know um, when we did this project and through our research, and we found that it was important to, for us to include sustainability and in, mm -hmm. like how that relates to the buyer mm -hmm. within Wilson Creek, not only in like your site plan and vegetation and native stuff like that, but how are you all presenting your sustainable options to your clients? How do you market that as something that's valued? Absolutely, very good question. So when it comes to the building codes, a lot of these cities are have high building codes, high energy, um, I-2020 IUCC, and a lot of the things that we're already required to do helps these homes be very, very tight. They're very efficient as is. Um, you, th things we're doing right now, we were not doing five and six years ago, having extra seal around outlets, um, having to, the list goes on, but, oh my goodness. Like we're just moving, for example, to a new IECC in a new city that just adopted it, having to change our ex complete exterior sheathing, um, make our brick wedge ledges wider. So in this target market, I would say that we, we let them know that their home is being built very efficiently, which is a fantastic thing. At the same time, if you approach someone, this is just my personal opinion, um, and others I've talked to in the DFW market, if you get buyer, would you like to spend $10,000 to get your kitchen upgraded, or would you like to $10,000 $10, on solar panels? You're likely gonna get that kitchen, right? 
Um, I'm not undervaluing the importance of sustainability. The homes are built very tight and efficiently. But I just think when it comes to optionality, we currently don't have a lot of options for that in our market. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Yeah. I'm interested in underbuilding some of those 40, or the bigger lots mm -hmm. and some of the 40 foot homes. What are the potential pros and cons of that from a developer's perspective? Um, and also, is there a maximum number of those that you would be doing? Would you cap it at any point in time? That's a very good question. And when it comes to underbuilding, the values I would say is, you know, you're able to get some some buyers that have that really that need for a larger yard too. And we're definitely you'll see higher premiums on those lots if they're um, underbuilt. Um, so that's a good thing for the profit on our end um, for the, the oversized, but at the same time, you'll have that different demographic who may have a lot of pets or something like that. Um, in terms, what was the second piece of that question? If there would be like a max number of lots that you'd be willing to underbuild, okay. you could cap it at any point? Um, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, but no I, w I wouldn't say there's a cap. I mean, well, there would be a strategy behind it for sure. Um, and I think that we've, we've pivoted on that too at times, decided, okay, we're just kidding. We're gonna do the 50s here because we think at this point in time, it's gonna do better than the 40s. And it honestly may change once we start to see the sales come through. If we start to see the sales come through and our 50s product just goes off the chart as opposed to our 40s, we're not gonna underbill. We're gonna sell that 50s and, and do better because we know it's selling better. Um, but it's kind of untested waters. We kind of see and move from there. Yeah, that flexibility sounds great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah. strategy to where if the market starts to fall you start to underbuild the lots and shrink the home mm -hmm. so that lowers, lowers your ASP and that gets you to either where the market's current buyer is or to a price point that has you know changed yep. so all of a sudden you may see 30 foot wide product on 50 foot wide lots and it can and without having to drastically change anything else right you're not going to vinyl you're not going to no brick you're not going to anything all of a sudden the house is just organically get a little smaller and really nobody notices. But yeah. that is a very good risk mitigation strategy. So if something changes, start underbuilding. So all mm -hmm. of you teams next year better <laughs> have that as a strategy. Fantastic, thank you. Another piece of it too is it, um, we do some of these plans, the 40s plans, have optionality to do a third car garage. So if we start to see that this, this market really likes that third car garage, if we're building on a larger lot with a 40 foot plan, we can start offering that as an option. I'm not saying we're gonna do that here, but it, it's a big value, value add a lot in our market. Anybody else? Um, so I have another question about you all site plan that you all developed. Mm -hmm. um, looking at it, because the lot types were necessarily color coded, I don't say, yes, they are. So I see that you've clustered a lot of your lot types together. Um, can you speak about why you all did that as opposed to more of a diverse kind of placement of your lot types? We did. And you know what? I'm, I'm not going to I don't typically see this a lot from us. And I, I, I don't have a good answer for you on that. I, I got to ask some people because I was curious about that myself. I mean, it's obviously good coming into phase one, having a, a 70 foot and a 50 foot um, off the bat because you have your good product mix there. Um, but I, I'll have to get back with you. OK, thank you. Yeah. 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 And sometimes it's the, when you're going through plan approval, they will, they have it in their head, especially in somebody like this, or in a place like this that has such high standards. Um, they want to see the use of the three different lot types and they kind of force your hand a little bit. So then you end up clustering to satisfy, um, you know, whatever it is. And then, you know, there's all sorts of things that they review as far as school, school and, you know, there's a bunch of things that they look at that can force lot types you don't necessarily want. Anything else? Uh, so for my question, I noticed you have two stub outs kind of heading towards the south end. I was wondering if you are planning to develop on that south end or if you've already started the process of maybe acquiring a permit to develop and maybe continue working with the city of Solano. You mean just like south of this property? Correct. Um, at this time, nothing is in the plans right now.
Hi, I had a question about your phasing plan. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I'm, I haven't seen before personally is having uh, phase two being completely separate from another section of what's considered phase two. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what your thought process was as far as uh, material deliveries and construction traffic overlap and those kinds of things. It's a good question. So, you know, we did talk about like the kind of the horizontal run of, of the utilities, but when it comes to how we release these lots too, um, is we're going to have obviously some different buyers that are interested in those lots in the top of phase two and the bottom of phase two. So we're going to have a release strategy put in place to um, show how we're going to build out. I mean, we're not just, we're not going to you throw a dart, pick your lot, here's entire phase two. It's going to be strategic in, in terms of dropping materials and things like that. Um, try to stack it in line as much as possible. Um, but it's, yeah, we'll do the same concept for the top. It's called a lot release strategy, so we just don't open up the entire thing. Um, but we'll give some kind of strategy when it comes to logistics of how we start and sell those homes. Great. Well, thanks, judges. Thanks, Pulte, for sponsoring. Unfortunately, we're out of time, and that's, that's it for questions right now. So thank you, students, for coming and participating this year. Awesome. Thanks, y'all.